this morning for taking the fall and thinking of us. And we thank you for his humiliation in the incarnation. Man, there is the humiliation of his deity. And he became man, but it's also a humiliation as a man. He became a servant, a man. And we thank him that the Bible says that that though he was rich, for our sake he became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. How many of you are rich this morning? Amen. Amen. I want you to know that you're rich this morning, not because of you, but in spite of you, you're rich in Christ. Amen. And that's the glory of the gospel, that people who are poor, wretched, and evil sinners can obtain wealth in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Because when you receive Christ, his, our guilt is imputed to him and his purity is imputed to us. Amen. Amen. You are clean, you are righteous, you are forgiven because of Christ. Amen. Amen. And we rejoice in that every Lord's day. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to let you know I want to get back into the book of Joshua. Oh. Amen. My daughter, my daughter said she don't like that. She didn't want me to go back to Joshua, but I'm going back. To Joshua, I want to do some expositional preaching. I've done uh, some thematic, topical preaching, and I, my hope to do is to intersperse uh, some of the thematic subjects throughout the year. Amen. Uh, I think they are a great and healthy break from the grind of expositional preaching. Amen. To put some thematic, because there, there are certain doctrinal topics that in an expositional series we do not cover in a year, and I believe that certain things need to be cycled through every year. Amen. Every year, church, you hear something about the family, yes. something about the gospel, something about sanctification, amen, something about stewardship and service. We should hear about those things every year as we preach expositionally through certain books, amen? amen. So that's what I'm attempting to do this morning, is to go back now to our series that we were on in out of the book of Joshua, and it's about living out a courageous faith is the series title, and our text this morning is in Joshua chapter 8, is where we left off, Joshua 8, verse 30 through 35. When you have it, say amen, please stand on your feet out of reverence and respect for God's word. Let me pray and ask God's blessing on our time. Gracious Lord, our God, we thank you for another opportunity to preach your word. We pray, Lord God, that you would, by your spirit, by your grace, plant your word in our hearts. That you would not allow Satan to snatch it away. That you would put in our hearts such a great fear of you and a reverence for you. That we would leave this place not being the same people that we were when we walked in. But that we would be better. That our lives and our hearts would be renewed and our character would more and more reflect your son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful. We pray that you would help us to be clear in our presentation of your truth. And we pray most important that somebody would see Christ. We ask this in your most precious name and for your sake we pray. Amen. Joshua chapter 8, verse 30 through 35, it reads like this. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron. And they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on the side of the ark, on the side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, 
as Moses the servant Lord had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all of, of, of that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. Again, looking at that 33rd verse, the B part. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people. You may be seated in the presence of God. This morning, I want to look at the blessedness of covenant relationship. The blessedness of covenant relationship. There's a song written by a gospel artist named Byron Cage. And the song says, I can feel the presence of the Lord and I'm going to get my blessing right now. I can feel the presence of the Lord and I'm going to get my blessing right now. Let me submit to us this morning that we have a wrong idea of what it means to be blessed. Yeah. <laughs> that our, our view of blessed and what it means to be blessed in our day really is narrow. It concerns primarily our temporal interest. Yeah. What it means to be blessed in our day is to have riches, <laughs> to have success in temporal affairs, to have health. Someone actually said the other day on television, your health is wealth. And we think that's what it means to be blessed, to have riches, to have health, to have wealth, and success in the temporal affairs of life. And let me say this, I don't want to be just, just all the way, just throw that out, because that in, in, in some sense, that is what it, those are blessings. Right. Amen. Amen. But they are not what it means to be blessed in the deepest sense of the word. Blessedness is a state of being in divine favor. Amen. Amen. What it means to be blessed is to be in God's favor, to have his love, and to have his approval. Amen. And let me add this to you, that you can have all of the material success, you can have... Uh, you can have temporary success in your affairs of life, you can have health and you can have wealth, and it yet be true that God, that you are not in God's favor. Amen. There are instances in scripture where people enjoy those external temporal things who did not have God's favor, who were not in the favor of God, and yet that was the assumption. Yeah. How many of you remember the rich young ruler? Yeah. <laughs> he had a lot of money. He was, th this, this guy was stacked. Amen. And he asked Christ the question, Lord, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And, and Christ asked the question, have you read what the law says? He said, oh, yeah, I've read the law. The law says that I have to love God with all my heart, with all my mind, soul, and my strength, and my neighbor as yourself. Amen. Now, I am to love God supremely, and I am to love my neighbor equally. He, he, he responds by saying to Christ, I've done, I, I, I've done all that. I've kept the law since I was a child. Amen. And Christ decides to put him to the test. Christ decides to test his supreme love to God and his equal love toward his brother. Christ asks the question, well, go sell all of your riches and go give them to the poor. Uh. Amen. You see, for mother, for him, riches was an idol. Amen. And the Bible said this man walked away sorrowfully because in his heart, his supreme love was not toward God. His supreme love was toward his money. And the fact that he not, was not willing to give his money to the poor showed that he didn't have an equal love for his brothers also. 
In every way, this man was a violator. He was a lawbreaker. Amen. But he found blessedness in riches, but he did not have the blessedness in a truth that says that he did not have the favor of God. Amen. That's just, that's just the assumption today that if you have money, if you have things, if you have success, God must be with you. God must be on your side. What other reasons would rappers have when they get up on television or an award show and say, I want to give honor to my God and save Jesus Christ? Everything about their life misrepresents Christ, does not bear any fruits of Christ, but yet they pay him homage on a war show because they believe that their riches and their wealth come from him. Amen. That God is on their side. That God is in their favor. Let me tell you something. You can have all the money in the world and God not be on your side. You can, have, you can be cured of your physical disease and still, not have, still have to deal with your sin disease. Amen. You can be debt free financially and still have to pay a sin debt. You can have all of these things and not be truly in the favor of God. Amen. Here's my purpose this morning as I, as I, in, in the sermon. My purpose is to help Christians grasp why we are blessed. <laughs> why is it that the Christian is blessed? And we'll do this by looking at the blessings that Jehovah announces on his people on a solemn occasion, an instance of worship in the history of Israel. This is what you have in the text. This, this is a solemn occasion. This is an instance of worship. But let me note this in passing several things. One thing is this. I want to note that to us that everything in worship is to reflect the integrity and the seriousness of God and spiritual things. Amen. Everything in worship is to reflect the integrity <laughs> and the seriousness of God and spiritual things. We're not in here to play. Amen. I'm not in here to entertain you. I'm here to edify you. Amen. I don't care if you're entertained by me. I want you to be built up. I want you to leave here with an understanding. Amen. Amen, somebody. And we need to guard against things in worship that render our worship contemptible in the eyes of the world. There's certain conduct that you can have, even in the context of liturgical worship, that renders your worship contemptible in the eyes of the world. That when the word of God is being preached, when I was coming up, it was wrong for us to, to pass notes. Amen. <laughs> there was a reason for that, because, because, because the, word, the word of God is the verbium day, it's the voice of God. And when, the, when God is speaking, that means you ought to be quiet. Amen. Amen. What's that? What, what, is, what is that? Uh, that old commercial by G.F. Hudden? When G.F. Hudden speaks, everybody listens. Right. I ain't talking about G.F. I'm talking about I'm talking about G.O.D. Jehovah God. When He speaks, everybody should listen. We should hear His word. His word. The Bible says you should hear His word with trembling. Amen. That this is the word that's been inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is the. This is the handiwork of God. It's the gift of God, to God of God to His church. It is the scepter of Christ's royal reign and rule. He rules us by His word, and every time the word of God is declared and opened up, the Bible is opened up. You should be quiet. In the Old Testament, in the Book of Ezra, when the prophet opened the word of God, the people stood up. They stood at attention because this is the word of God, beloved. Amen, somebody. We couldn't, we, we, we couldn't take excessive notes. We couldn't chew gum. We couldn't eat food because that diminishes. It makes our, it lessens our worship. We're not here to eat. We're here to eat the bread of life. Amen, somebody. You got people in their church today who, who have no real regard for and reverence for worship. They regard it like because we treat it like. Yeah. When I was coming up, men could not wear hats in church because men would not to put anything on their hands because that was a sign of their authority. Amen. Yeah. And it was irreverent for a man to put something on his head. 
Amen. Because they, we, we believe what the Bible said. That a man should, should not have easily covering his head because it's a sign of his position both in the family and in the church. Amen. It's contemptible, church. Now we, we, we should guard against things that make our worship contemptible before the world. Amen. Amen. We should hear the word of God and we should come to church every week prepared to have serious engagement with the truth. Amen. Do you know that this for a small period of time that you have an opportunity to have a serious engagement with the truth? And I would do you a disservice if all I did was give you a few, a few points in a poem. Tell you, tell you a whole bunch of stories and not help you understand the truth about God. And can I say this to you as well? That knowing about who God is, sometimes the truths are not always simple. Some of these truths are complex. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't get quiet on me. Amen. If you study any major discipline, it's not easy to learn that discipline. If you study biology, is that easy or hard? hard. What about chemistry? Hard. <laughs> what about law? Yeah. And so you think theology should be different? No, it requires, it, it requires a mental attentiveness and a commitment to hear and to be taught. Amen. 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 <laughs> and, you, and when we come to church all Sunday morning at high ground, we intend to have a real engagement with the truth of God. Amen. 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 This was a solemn occasion. It's a solemn occasion. That God was bringing into frame something very meaningful for his people. And there are three things I want to consider about this occasion that are important that I want you to highlight this morning as an outline. One, I want to consider first the timing. Timing of the blessing. And then we'll consider the location and the participants. And then we'll lastly consider the solemn forms. Amen. There are three things that are important here. One, the timing. Two, the location and participants. And then lastly, the solemn forms. Those are the religious rites that are employed and observed by Israel. Amen. Look at verse number 30. Amen. You have your Bibles open? Amen. Now in this church, you're going to need your Bible open. Amen. Because <laughs> any reference I have is going to come right from the Bible. Amen. In verse 30, 830, in verse the eighth part, it says, Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel about uh, on in Mount Ebal, as, the, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of the whole stones, over which no man had lifted up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Joshua built an altar at Mount Ebal. But I want you to know carefully the time is the Bible says, then he built it. Now, when it, then is an article of time. When did he build it? Why did Joshua choose to have this worship service when he did? I want you to know that it's not by coincidence that this worship service comes on the heels of two of the significant victories in the life of Israel. One of the victories was the victory at Jericho. The other victory was the victory at a place called Ai. Both are two victories, but they're different, but they're victories. And they're two great victories. Amen. Remember that at Jericho, that victory came by, by direct and miraculous intervention. The people walked, marched around that wall six times in a silent procession. On the seventh time, by the word and the decree of Joshua, they would shout. And when they shouted, the walls came tumbling down. That is a miraculous intervention. This was a stronghold with high walls, high brick walls. And at the shout of God's people, the walls came tumbling down. And the people seized the land. Amen. God accomplished this victory by a miracle. Amen. Remember shortly thereafter that they were supposed to go to another place called Ai. Ai was not as big as Jericho, 
But nonetheless, it was a stronghold. It was a fortress. Because these places occupied the peak cities, the mountains in Canaan. And here's why it's important. If Israel possessed the peak cities, they would be in powerful position to seize all of Canaan. Because those two strongholds control the, the channel and the approaches to Canaan. If you can't get past Jericho, if you can't get past Ai, there's no way you can, you can seize the land. But Israel has accomplished that. They have won the victory both at Jericho and they won the victory at Ai. Remember at Ai, God had told quite previously before that Israel, when they entered the land, they were not to take anything out of that land of Jericho. They were to leave the possessions there and they were to burn it because the whole city was to be accursed. It was a sign of stewardship to God. They were to offer it to God as a first fruit. God had given it to them and they were to give that city back to him. Amen. I might as well pause here parenthetically and say, and say this. As God's people, when God gives you something, the way that you acknowledge him as the source of that blessing is to return a portion back to him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God don't give you everything to keep for yourself. When God gives you an increase to acknowledge him, the way you do that is by taking a portion of that and giving it back to him. Amen. God, you are the source of my blessing. All my good things have come from you. And because I got it from you, to acknowledge you, I'm going to give a portion of it back to you. Well, Israel failed to do that. The Bible says that, 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 that Akon, a guy, stole some of that stuff for himself. He stole... A, he stole a reward and blessing that was supposed to be set aside for the Lord. And when they went to fight the small town, the Bible says that they were routed. And then God came back and the prophet Joshua judges Ai for his sin. He dies and God says, go up there and do it again. And they go up there as a nation and they conquer Ai and they rout them. At that, after they rout them, Joshua has this solemn worship service. And let me say this, and here's, the point. Here's, here's what I want you to see. That God's victories should always call us to worship in faith. Amen. When God does some great thing in your life, when God performs some great work in your life, it should always call you to worship in faith. Has God been good to you? Amen, somebody. What has God done for you? Everything should call you to worship the faith. Let me, let me submit to you that there have been providential bounties, the things that God has done for you. God has made a way for you. God has allowed you to have health. Help. Uh, he gives you strength. Some of you are wearing nice clothes. Did you know there are people out there who don't have the clothes you got on? who struggle every day to figure out what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat, but you eat every day in the midst of a pandemic. And then somebody, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Come on, look here. And I'm still getting weight. Amen. Everybody outside, the, the people are suffering economically, and God is still taking care of providing for his people. You ought to bless his name. You ought to thank him for being so good to you. Because God in his providence gives to some what he withholds from others. He makes some rich, he makes others poor. <laughs> if God has blessed you, if you found any benefit from temporally from him, you ought to bless him for his temporal benefits, but you ought to also bless him for his saving benefits. By, by grace, you've been saved by a miracle of love and a miracle of grace. You've been saved. You, you owe it to him to worship him and to put your faith in him. Aren't you glad that he saved you? <laughs> this is to be a model for us as a church. We're called to rejoice and the victories already won by Christ. I don't have to wait for something new to happen in my life for me to come to God in church and worship him and to put my faith in him. He's already done enough. His son has already won the victory. Amen. Do you know Jesus Christ has already won you the victory? Colossians says 
that you have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son? That you have been made an, an heir with the saints in light that God has given you an inheritance? That you've been forgiven already? Amen. I don't have to wait until the judgment to figure out what's going to happen to me. I already know what's going to happen to me. Amen. I'm going to be acquitted. Because I've already been acquitted in God's son. Aren't you glad today that you've been acquitted? Amen. It should always call us to worship and to faith. How do you, <laughs> what I want to say is this, is how God can do so much for you. And how God can bless you so good. And you come to church and you keep your mouth quiet. You come here looking like you got lemon on your face. <laughs> The preacher got a prod and, and, and sweat to get you to say amen. You ought to come in here. You ought to come to church with a, with a praise. Come here with a, with a thanksgiving. The psalmist says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his court with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. You ought to offer to God the fruit of your lips. When you get in church, there ought to be no way I should keep you quiet. And don't tell me what I'm trying to do. Let's hear it. Church, listen, there, there are moments where we ought to be pensive and thoughtful, and there are moments where we ought to be emotional and jubilant. All of that happens in church. Amen. When you read the Psalms, when you read the Psalms, the Psalms are noisy. They're shouting, there's clapping, all of them to express jubilance and adoration to a God who's been so good to you. God always calls us to worship in faith. Amen. And here's why, here's why I'm going to say this. Church, listen to me. Hear me The reason why it's important for you to worship God is because whatever you refuse to worship God for, you're going to bow to. Y'all catch that? If you refuse to worship God for something, you're gonna, that means you're going to bow to it. The praise and the adoration is going to go to the gift Rather than to the giver. Amen. 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 That's why everything you do becomes, becomes, becomes an activity of worship. When, when, when God gives you an A or exam, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you gave me the mind. You gave me the ability. When, 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 when God wakes you up, thank you, Lord. I didn't wake myself up. My alarm clock to wake me up. You touched me with a finger of love. My grandmother and me used to say all the time, my grandfather used to pray. And he used to pray these prayers in church, and I used to just laugh at him. But he used to say, you know what? Lord, I thank you. I thank you. That when I woke up this morning, he said, that bed that I slept in last night, that it was not my cooling board. And those sheets that I pulled over my, over, over my shoulders, they were not my whining sheets. I don't know what that means. He, he, talking about, he talking about dying. He said, God, always when I woke up this morning, it's because of you. Yeah. That bed I stepped in could have been like at the morgue, my cooling board, and my sheets could have been my wine sheets. But did God wake you up this morning? Amen. More than that, has God awakened your soul by the truth of the gospel? Have you been resurrected? Have you been quickened by the Holy Spirit that you want to worship the Lord for it? You want to bless his name? Not just the timing of it is significant, shows that this is a, a meaningful event, but also the, the location and the participants. Look at verse number 33. You have to say, man. Amen. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on the side of the ark, on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal. Now where the priest stood was in between Mount Gerizim on one hand and Mount Ebal on, on the other. And where they stood was in the valley of Shechem. You Bible readers will recall that, that Shechem has great and tremendous significance in Bible history. Because it was at Shechem when Jacob wrestled with an angel all night. 
It was at Shechem where Isaac met his wife, Rebecca. It was at Shechem where Jesus talked to that Samaritan woman about worship and about being born again, about him being the Messiah. All these things happened at Shechem. And this was a meaningful experience. This is a great experience for us today. That they were in a, they were in a prime location and then know all of, the, all of the participants, all who took part in this worship ceremony. The Bible says the whole assembly of Israel, the whole congregation, the officers, the magistrates, the men, the women, the children, and the strangers who were living among them. That would have been people like Rahab. Rahab, who would live in Jericho when she died, when, when, when they conquered it, God had promised that he would preserve her. She was now living among as the cultists of the Jews, living as a Gentile among the Jews. Okay. Amen. She was a believing one who believed and put her hope and faith in the coming Messiah. She was saved and she was living among as a, as a Gentile among Jewish people. Amen. Here's what I want you to know carefully about this. Let's put this in your notes. This is very important. About that. The first thing I want, I want you to note is this, is that Israel is a geopolitical entity. <laughs> and it is both a civic and a church state. Amen. The church is not, there, 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 there is continuity and there is discontinuity. There is similarity and there is dissimilarity between the church and Israel. Amen. Israel was the people of God. Guess what? And the church, we are the people of God. Amen. Israel was God's physical people. We are God's spiritual people. Amen. To be a member in Israel, you can be born into it or have the accident or the privilege of birth, meaning that you, you can be born into the nation of Israel. Amen. Or you can be by ritual, engrafted into the nation of Israel. But in order to be a member of the church, you're not born to the church. Amen. Just because you are born to a family of believers, that don't make you a believer. Amen. Talk about my mama that went to church, but you're not going to heaven on a package deal. Amen. My grandma, my grandma, she was church her whole life. I know I'm going to heaven. No, you ain't going to heaven because of that. Listen, Papa may have. And mama may, my mama may have, but God bless the child who has his own. You have to have your own personal relationship with God. You must know Christ for yourself. Amen. Amen. And that's about it. You need to get to know Christ. Yeah. And you have, to, you, have, you have to repent of your sins and put your faith in him and your humble reliance upon his work in order to be saved. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We got kids who are growing up in church who feel like they're believers just because they go to church. Going to church does not make you a believer any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Yeah. <laughs> it don't make you a believer. Yeah. Amen. You are a believer by what you heartily profess. Watch the word heartily. Yeah. I didn't say you are a believer but simply because you profess. Because Christ himself has said, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord. That's a profession. Did we not preach in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not work miracles in your And he will say in that day, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. There are plenty of people who make a profession. But the real question is, what is your experience of it? How well grounded in it are you? Amen. Because you can profess a faith that you don't even possess. What is your experience of your faith? How do you show your faith? What are you going to prove it? What are you going to bear it out in your life? Amen. Hear me, church. The, 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 the true litmus test of a believer is in their desire and their heart to want to submit every aspect of their life to the will of God. Now, let, let, let me say this. As a Christian coming up who's sinful and fallen, that ain't always easy. No. Amen. 
There's a lot of things I read about, even as a pastor. I just go, ooh. <laughs> it's hard going down. Right? It's hard because I got that pride in me. Oh, boy, I got pride in me. And guess what? It ain't just in me, it's in you too. Amen. But we're not here to, 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 to offer you a faith of your own liking, of your own comfort. We're, offered, we're here to offer you the faith that God has revealed in Scripture, and your own heart rebels against that unless it's renewed by the power of God's grace. Are you born again today, church? Are you renewed? Are you God's new people? Here's my last point, not just the timing of it, the location of participants, but also the forms. There are, there are certain forms or religious rites that are observed here. These were things that were enjoined by the law of Moses. Two places, two, two things were, were, were ordered by the law of Moses. The first thing was the building of the altar. The building of the altar. Look at verse number 31. Verse 30, I'm sorry. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel. Now note here that God regulates his worship, that, that Israel was to observe him and to worship him according to his standards. Amen. We often have this assumption that if we want to give something to God that comes from our heart, that God should be, be pleased with it. Amen. It's the assumption of modern man that God is pleased with anything that we offer to him sincerely. You are sincerely wrong. God don't care about what you want to give him. God cares about what he asks you to give him. Amen. God wants you to worship him according to his forms, according to his rights, according to his way. And one of the forms which Israel was to offer his worship was upon an altar. Now, now, now get this carefully. Note, first of all, the method used in building the altar. The Bible says the altar was to be built of whole stone that had not been cut, that had not been touched by any iron tool used by man. That's significant for this reason because no amount of human effort and works and technology and ability and usefulness was to enter in to the altar. Because God wants to show us that, that the way that we approach him is not through our human effort. Amen. The way that we have a relationship with God is not through our works and through our gifts and through our ability. The way that we have a relationship with God is through the sacrifice of somebody else. And that's about it. Do you know you're blessed not because of you, but in spite of you because somebody was offered in your place that person is Jesus Christ. He became the victim for you. Do you know that your guilt as a sinful person was imputed to him that his beauty has been given to you? Amen. Why is it significant that, 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 that there is an altar there? It's significant because God is letting Israel know you sin. Listen to me, church. Hear me well. You know what's not being preached in churches today? That we are sinners. Amen. Amen. Everything is secret sensitive. Don't talk about that. You may offend somebody. They may not want to come back. Look, I don't care if you feel like you, you, you don't want to come back. That's fine. If I call you a worm and a wretch that offends you, go right over here. Don't come back. Amen. Because the Bible calls you a worm and a wretch. Amen. The Bible says that all we like sheep have gone astray. The Bible says that we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity, but as sinful fallen creatures, we have a hard time seeing ourselves as sinful people. We all think ourselves of ourselves being as basically good, having some righteousness or some goodness whereupon we, God may accept us or bestow his love. There's a text, look at Ephesians 4.17. Ephesians 4.17. And Paul exhorts in Ephesians 4.17 that we no longer walk in the futility of our mind, in the vanity of our mind. What he's saying to us is this. That there are certain vain, <laughs> foolish thoughts that fallen men have. That we are deprived of, of understanding about spiritual things. I 
about one, the nature and the perfection of God. That God is holy and God is righteous. Our God is not holy. Our God is all loving. I, I hate when people say, well, only God can judge me. What they really mean is that God won't judge me because God doesn't judge. But the God of Scripture is not just a loving father, but he's also a vengeful judge. Amen. Amen, somebody. But our sinful fallen hearts won't allow us to see that. We have wrong ideas about God and his perfection, but we also have wrong ideas about sin and his consequences. Oh, beloved, sin is not some small evil. Sin, if you don't repent of it, if you don't turn from it and turn to Christ, sin will find you in the hell forever. Amen. And guess what? Hell is a real place. Amen. And we tend to think that when people die, they're in a better place. Not so. Yeah. If you die in an undependent state, in a Christless state, you don't go to heaven, you go to hell. Amen. There are only two definitions for men. There's heaven and there's hell. There's no, there's, there's no, there's no middle, middle place. There's no purgatory where you work your sins out. No. Either you put your faith in Christ and you go to heaven or you put your faith, don't put your faith in him and you go to hell. Amen, somebody. Amen. Uncle Ray Ray is in a better place. No, he ain't. He believes believe in Jesus. Amen, somebody. He just started suffering. Amen. Amen. We have wrong ideas about, about sin. It's consequences. We have wrong. We don't have to. We are deprived of, in our understanding about Christ, his person, his offices, his work. We're deprived in our understanding about the spirit, his work in our soul. We're deprived in our understanding about the scriptures. The scriptures are holy. They're pure. Without error. Only the Holy Spirit can teach you that. Amen, somebody. Amen. That also wants to tell, tell you that we are sinners in need of a savior. And here's the good news. God provided one. God provided some sacrificial sacrifices to help purge his people's sins. Amen. Amen. Not, just, not just that, but I want you to know, know about this also. It's not just the building of the altar, but it's also the blessing of the people. That there, that, that, that there is this, these are things that, 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 that the law has enjoined by Moses. Moses ordered that the, that the altar be built in a certain way, and Moses ordered that the Levitical priests bless the people. Amen. 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 Now note this carefully. One, the blessing was a prayer and a close to the service. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's really a benediction. We have, we have a picture of something called Aaron's benediction, found in number 6, verse 22 to 26. And in Aaron's benediction, he said something like, May the Lord lift up his face upon you. Right. Amen. <laughs> may his countenance shine upon you. Right. May, he, may he give you his peace. Right. Amen. Here's what I want you to see about that. The, the priest stood in, 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 in a representative capacity. The priest represented the, pe the people did not represent themselves. It shows us the, 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 the disintegration of the image bearer Adam. That Adam, before he sinned, could go to God by himself. But now because he's fallen, he needs some pure, pure, acceptable representative to stand in the gap for him. He needs a mediator. That mediator, church, is Jesus Christ. You can't go to God by yourself. You can't go to God without Christ. That's why Christ says, says something like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes from the Father but by me. Amen. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. Don't let this world fool you. There are not many ways to God. There's only one way. Amen. That informs the urgency of our, of our life. And that, that makes our task of evangelism urgent. Because if Christ is the only way, I got to make sure that people can see the way. Amen. Amen. If there's, if there's other ways, then where's the urgency? Amen. Amen. Travel any roads you want to travel, you'll, you'll find your way there. 
But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that men need a mediator, and the only mediator between God and men is Jesus Christ. He's the only mediator. There's only one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the one who came to bear your sins at Calvary. He's the one who came to accomplish your righteousness. If you're going to be saved, you've got to put your trust in him. Amen. Not just, not just priesthood. <laughs> Oh, Lord, give me strength. But then notice afterwards, there's a reading of the law. And I'm done here on this point. Moses wrote the law. He laid them on the stones of the altar. He copied it. And then afterwards, Joshua, he reads the all of the law before the entire nation. Amen. Amen. I'll make several, several points, and I'm going to say this. First of all, the first thing I want, I, point I want to make is obedience is consistent with the highest acts of faith. Amen. 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 <laughs> that, that, that obedience manifests faith. It shows faith. Amen. It takes faith and trust to obey God. Amen. Second, I'll make this point of this. As sinful, fallen creatures, we got a problem with obedience. Amen. <laughs> there's what we ought to do, and then there's what we are not doing. There's always this the discrepancy between what we ought to do and what we're not doing. But here's what God does for us as a Christian. He don't write his laws on stones. He writes his laws in your heart. He puts his spirit in your heart. He gives you a new heart. Ezekiel said he takes out of your heart of stone, he gives you a heart of flesh. Amen. Amen. Well, now you have a genuine desire for his love and a genuine desire for what is good. Yeah. Do you know why you have the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is in your life to make you ready and willing to obey the Lord. Yeah. Here's why this is important. Israel had a special theocratic relationship with God where all of their blessings were dependent upon their obedience. Amen. Now, let me, I want to make this distinction. Their obedience, obedience is not the condition for them, for them entering their favored condition of, of redemption. They, they, they didn't have to obey to be redeemed. God saved them. But it was in order to continue in the blessings of the covenantal relationship. If they were going to continue to have God be by their side, be there near them, protect them, and preserve them in the land, they had to obey it. I said, that is a special theocratic arrangement, but that is not true for us as God's people at the church. God's going to be with us because we already put our faith in Christ and he has obeyed. And there's somebody. That's why God will never leave you. God can never forsake you. Because all your, all your obligations have been transferred to Christ. And even when you don't obey, thank God that his obedience is yours. That's why I want to say that as Christians, we are permanently blessed. Amen. 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 I'm not blessed only when I obey and God rewards me. I'm blessed because God rewards me for the sake of Christ. Yeah. And he does it even when I don't deserve it. Yeah. None of us deserve to wake up in the morning. No. None of us deserve to breathe the air that we breathe. Yeah. But all of those blessings have been sanctified to us by the blood of his son. Yeah. Amen. 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 Because he stood in our place, as, as Sister uh, Ella told us this morning, he obeyed all the law for us. And he died for your sins, secured your blessing. If you put your faith in him, if your trust is him, you are blessed no matter what your outward situation may look like, you are blessed. Amen. How many of you got to be blessed this morning? Amen. 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 Gracious Lord our God, we thank you, Father, for your word. 
We thank you, Lord, for your grace. Because truly your grace solely is the impetus for a life of obedience. You call us as your people in salvation to a life of obedience. And it is your grace that is the, is the driving force behind it. It's your grace and the love that Christ constrains us to, which is a love for truth, a love for submission to your will. And it's on account of the fact that he died for us and that we have this great affection and fondness for him as his people, as your church, we're willing to submit, lay down our lives, surrender our independence and adapt our life to his will. We pray that you would give us continued grace by your spirit to surrender our life and our will to yours, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all please stand.